Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. 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 So two things actually were the inspiration for this. You know, one is I woke up at like 5.30 this morning. I had to be across town, which literally takes me 45 minutes by scooter um, by 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, for a meeting. I was meeting with like seven or eight people. Whatever it was, I was inspired by one of the people at the meeting there, and it made me think about the rest of my day and what I was doing. And I was, you know, meeting with this lady to learn more about her business, which is called Social Giver. We'll talk about that, right? Mm. And then I had lunch, a meeting around lunch, basically. It was like 11 o'clock to sort of after 1 o'clock with a company called Trip Ally, um, which we can get into mm. what, the, what, they, what they do. And then later in the day, I was taking phone calls from Utini, a company that I've helped raise money from. And sort of at the end of the day, I was working with Udin, which is from a guy that also lives in Bangkok, but he's from Finland. And frankly, interspersed, I was working on a real estate deal in the United States. So I just and, – and it just dawned on me that I just feel so lucky because – if I look at the job that I used to do before, right, it was all about information gathering, information analysis, and it was all done kind of in real time, right? That's what trading is. And one of the reasons why I liked it was because I really had to constantly learn like new things. But it was one of those jobs at a corporation where everything you do every day could be potentially different because you didn't know what type of information was going to be thrown at you. And I always thought that that's perfect training for what I do now, and there were days then where like I didn't learn anything new and it was kind of rote and boring. And while that does happen to me sometimes now, it's so much less likely. And I just kind of wanted to run through for the listeners what exactly that feels like and why it's so powerful, right? Because mm. we talk a lot about how we spend time trying to connect the dots in the, in the tech world, but just in the world really more than anything, yeah. right? I learn about this. I learn about that. I talk to you and I say, what do you th-? And And at the end, we'll talk about something because I want – to get both of our opinions. But that dot connection, mm. and this was something I was talking about this morning, is really important. Somebody asked me, what do you do? And I said, you know what I do really well? I connect the dots. Right. I learn about this, I learn about that, and I figure out ways where all the things that I know can somehow be interconnected, and each one of them can, not to use a bu- buzzword, because I was taking flack for this today, um, I actually said something was being optimized. I'd never use the word leverage, but I'll use it now. <laughs> you can see where this is like buzzword bingo. Um, and But these things actually do leverage off of each other. Mm. Well, it's anyway. great, isn't it, in a world where everybody's becoming a specialist, whether they're a software engineer or a specialist conversion optimizer online, yeah. that you can have this skill where you can connect the dots, right? Yeah. Rather than being a specialist, you're a generalist. But there's a real value in being a generalist, right? You can bring in experience from different industries. You can see a pattern here and a pattern there and bring it together. Absolutely. And I see you doing it all the time, actually. And I feel like I try to do that on a, on a day-to-day basis. Hmm. Let's, talk, let's talk a little bit let's about um, Social Giver. This is a company, actually, that I heard about a couple of years ago. And today, I was actually lucky, lucky enough to meet one of the founders. Right? So the idea of this business, right? And we talk... I want to talk about everything in the context of technology in Asia and kind of just combine all the things that you and I always talk about, right? So the idea for this is that you can contribute to social causes via a very well-developed technology platform, enjoy a better lifestyle at the same time, and still give sort of companies and enterprises that are trying to do CSR, right, corporate social responsibility, some of the kind of PR benefits that should accrue to them for doing it. And we can talk about why that matters in a second, right? And how this is different. So here's like the beginning of how my day is different. The founder is Thai. And she spent her life kind of growing up all over the world, was educated in Thailand for her undergraduate degree, got a master's degree in England, and spent time working in the corporate world doing logistics and supply chain management, Mm. right? And she was actually telling me this morning, she said, a lot of people, and, and this is where we started talking about connecting the dots, right? So a lot of people ask her, why did you make a career change? Why did you switch from supply chain management to doing social giver? And, and I said to her, it actually seems to me like not a career change, but just applying all the things you learned in supply chain management. So taking disparately located inputs, create, helping create a product, distributing that product through logistics, 
right? And then creating a payment system that allows people to buy that product, which at the beginning was nothing except a group of unrelated inputs. Mm -hmm. And she just looked at me and said, no one's ever said that to me before, but that's exactly the way I feel about this. And that's what I mean when I say I get to sit there and learn and talk to her about that platform, her relationship to it, and figure out really quickly, just based on what she's saying, how it dovetails super nicely with what she was doing before. But let's talk a little bit about this model. This woman's like tireless about, and her founder is as well. He does some of the, the tech stuff and manages that, right? But her commitment, right, to taking what she calls the excess or the kind of leftover product or services that big companies have and figuring out a way to distribute them in a way that's responsible, but that sort of benefits everybody's lifestyle as well means I believe she's really hit an inflection point, right? People want to do CSR. People want to give back. Corporations want to get the benefit from it, but nobody really knows how to do this properly. And it turns out that corporations are trying really hard to figure out. And I think their heart's in the right place, right? You can say all you want about how CSR is just a bunch of optics, but they would do better if they could. And she's creating a platform where they could, where they're doing better, right? Mm. So it turns out, that they don't have enough experience doing this properly. And so what does she do? She's gone out and created a platform so that every side, and I said to her, trade, every side of this trade, because I kind of think of most things in that um, in that respect just based on my history, right? But every, every person that's involved in this benefits. How does it work? So the corporation gets all the benefit of the CSR. They're doing it anyway, and she just gives them a new platform, a new way to do this. The social enterprises, remember, these are not charities, right? These are businesses that want to do social good by earning money and get funded. They do get funded, right, benefit because they get the money that they need. And they don't get it directly. They get it indirectly, right? So people don't, people feel good about it. The donors get tangible goods in return for their giving and services in, in some cases. And everybody feels good about it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So everybody benefits, right? And it's a really modern model of, instead of just saying, you're a rich person with excess, how can I convince you to give to somebody less fortunate than you? Do they see it as a CSR model? Or do they see it? I think, no, they, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, I mean, you know, because CSR is a sort of a loaded term, isn't it? It has a lot of it connotations, is. right? It is. It is. And I don't, think, I don't think that they would tell you that what they're doing is CSR, but in a way they're disintermediating, right? Think about it this. Here's the way it works. Let's just say I have money to give, but I don't know how to give it, and, and I don't maybe, I don't like charity, okay? But there are plenty of sort of noble causes out there. Mm-hmm. And let's say I'm a big corporation, and I'm in the, I don't know, the hotel business, let's say. And I have excess hotel rooms that are maybe open seasonally, so I know that I'm going to have, let's say, five rooms available at all times during a particular season. I offer them for half price. So I buy it, and one of the conditions of me buying is that the money that I pay for that room does not go to the company, but the company takes it and directly gives it to a social enterprise Mm -hmm. that fits into a category that I've pre-chosen and pre-agreed with that that, uh, transaction everybody's happy so the room gets used the corporation gets all the benefits of what they would get for doing socially responsible things but really does something socially responsible and the money that i pay for the room doesn't go to the room which the corporation doesn't need necessarily because that room is going to be empty anyway Mm -hmm. right and the cost of servicing that room in my mind is way less than the price that they're charging for we know that we can run through that for days if you'd like Right. But everybody benefits because the person who's giving the money feels good. They also feel like they're getting something at a beneficial price. The ent- the social enterprise gets the money that they need. Right. And and the corporation gets the PR that's associated with CSR. And it's not just optics because they can actually point to a real thing that really gets funded. And the person who gave the money is happy because they get to choose to. So I, I really like this model. And it's not out there just for charity. This is very important. Right. It's not a model just for giving money away. But it's at some point, and I don't know this, right, because I didn't confirm this, but it makes sense to me, right, in the context of the way I like to invest into platforms, right, platforms that build things that mm-hmm. other people can plug into. It means that if I want to build a social enterprise, right, so I know we, we've talked about this, right, one of my friends, Joy, sees a market gap. She's building a business around helping educate children. 
right? But she's not doing it for free and she's not doing it for charity. But that's a social enterprise that aims to make money but does need to get funded as well because it needs computers, travel expenses, and things like that. But the localities are willing to pay for it because they're getting better service than they could otherwise get from whatever their existing sort of educational facilities are. But if, if the social giver business creates, and I think about it in these terms, a fund on the side that funds social enterprises that are set up to make money, it creates a virtuous circle where they make more money, they get better things to give away, they create social enterprises that need the money, that may create a profit, and people then go out and buy those products, use those products, have some of the money gets donated, and then it just keeps going around and around and around. So people make money, but people do good as well. Hmm. So does the that money makes- that, that comes from buying the excess inventory and in something like a you know, a hotel chain, does that go direct to social giver? Is that how the model works rather than goes through the, the, the hotel chain who then sort of, nope. you know, do their nope. CSR it, thing, right? Nope, it goes to it goes to the hotel chain. Right. Right, so like if I, I can buy, I was looking at the site today, right? You can look at it right now, socialgiver.com, and you can see, you can buy a ticket to Phuket for a thousand baht. It's normally, let's call it 3,000 baht. That money goes directly to Bangkok Airways according to the site, and then, but Bangkok Airways is booking that as if it's a three thousand dollar, a three thousand baht ticket, mm-hmm. right? So I didn't confirm this, but it's my understanding that Social Giver will take some kind of fee for arranging that transaction as well. That's the beginning of how this business works, right? So there is a fee for it, but what they're doing is they're they're giving people a platform, encouraging people to do socially responsible things, and in the process, you know, not just educating them about it, but like I said, giving them that platform for it. But in the process, helping the corporations, but also helping the people give to social, socially responsible enterprises. But that mm. money goes to the corp first, yeah? Right. Right? Got it. Okay, but so that, 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 that's the big problem, isn't it? I mean, it's a lot of that sort of excess inventory, which is, you know, sort of time-specific for them to offload that without actually impinging on their, you know, their existing market, you know, offloading cheaper inventory. Is often a challenge, isn't it? I mean, we've seen all those kind of models like Priceline and stuff like that, which never really worked well. Yeah, I. So again, I worked with someone, and his whole deal was I never paid more than a hundred dollars for a hotel room ever. And I went on a business trip with him once. <laughs> he never had a hotel room booked until literally, like, he was on his way to the airport, and it was never anywhere even remotely close to where our business meetings were. It was the most inconvenient thing in the world. I did not <laughs> like it all, but but this is different because Priceline was a bidding model. Yeah, right. price line was you give us a price, we'll give you twenty hotels or twenty sort of things that fit into that category, and we'll give you one of them, but you don't know what it is until that bidding process is done. This is different because it's fixed. Exactly. It's just another. It's just another way for corporations to allocate, you know, excess excess at any mm. level, and different companies can have different amounts, but also different things that are excess, whether it's a service or a good or anything. Right? Like you could have a sweater that you can't sell. You're willing to discount it anyway, but you, you give the money for the whole thing directly to a socially responsible enterprise, and it just recycles it within the economy. So it's slightly different than what the price line model is. Yeah, and it's hard to do. But again, just because it's hard to do doesn't mean you don't try to go out and do it. And I like it because they don't just want to do it in Thailand. You know, they want to do it in the whole region. But again, getting back to the beginning of this conversation, and we'll get back to this for each one of the, each of the few things we talk about today. I learned something today, right? I get to interact with this person who's building something completely different than, than using the tools that are out there to build something completely different than the normal businesses that I see on a day-to-day basis, right? Mm. It's just completely different. And I like the fact, you know, I rush there in the morning on my scooter, I get there, sit down, have this conversation, was there for about two hours or so, had that conversation, and then I had to completely change my mindset, okay, and then move on to working with a company called Trip Ally. We talked about Trip Ally in general terms a couple of weeks ago. We did, yeah. We did, didn't we? I don't remember if I actually mentioned the company itself. Mm-hmm, you did. Uh, I did, right? Okay. Exactly. But, but Trip Ally is a company I like quite a bit. I'm going to joke around a little bit, right, because it's four Russian founders that are trying to do something disruptive in the mobile data and telecom space, right? <laughs> I like it because the four founders all have kind of the same name. 
two Alexis, two Sergeys. It was right. like their parents had no idea what else to do with their names. <laughs> and almost every time I – and I, so I deal with this guy named Alexei Gordienko. He's great. Um, and he's the CEO of this business. I interact with the other guys sometimes when we have technical questions, right? But the whole point of this is I sat with him for two hours today too. A completely different business, a completely different mindset. I'm talking to him about potentially raising funds. Um, but also all the things that go along with working inside or working with a mobile telecoms company. I don't like playing guessing games, right? In other words, I don't like when people say, guess what this is or guess what that is. But I would presume that most people who use a smartphone, who use, a, you know, who use some kind of mobile data, don't understand how that system works mm. at all. Do you think that's fair? Yeah. Yeah, it just, <laughs> it's magic, isn't it? It just happens. It comes to your phone and you don't need to ask yeah. any questions. Yeah, I mean, I think it was Louis C.K. who said on um, the Conan O'Brien show, I don't remember, but it was a couple of years ago, he was like, you see people getting really mad, right, like on an airplane when it's flying, like when it's late or whatever. He's like, you're in a tube in the air. Yeah. You're going 12,000 kilometers away. Stop complaining. Or when people complain that, like, their cell phone is too slow, you know, he's like, it's going up into the heavens right. and coming back down to you. Just relax. Okay? But that's about, that's about the sum total of stuff that people know about how their cell phone works, right? But so again, for me, I go from social enterprises, how to turn that into a business, how to maybe build a fund around it, and how to do that to sitting with a guy who is literally going through things, that, again, I'd never learn and never get to know otherwise. It's like almost like a completely different day, right? Like you don't know. You, you know, right, if you live in the United States and come to Thailand or if you live in Europe and come to Thailand, how do you get data? You're roaming, you're doing Wi-Fi. You don't know how any of these things works. You wonder why, like, why is AT&T or Orange's relationship with DTAC, right? How does that whole concept work? I've, I had never even looked at a schema, and I could throw out, like, terminology for you. What are the key parts of that mobile network? Like, what's a VLR? Nobody knows, right? But that's the location register, for visitors coming in, there's a very specific place where all that data gets saved. I didn't know that. I just figured, I don't know. I don't even know what I figured. <laughs> but I get again, I get to sit with Alexei and I get to learn all of these things that I never would have known before. And, and that's one of the reasons why, like, I keep kind of ending up in a, in the same kind of job, where it's not sort of automated and rote factory work, but I get to wake up every day and see things that are new and different, right? And we'll come back to this. I don't, there's another company that I want to talk about that's trying to operate in the travel space. And that's really what this is, right? If I travel, how do I get data? Right, but just before you go on, that, just so for the listeners, that Trip Ally setup, these were the guys that we talked about that were putting the boxes on the mobile network. So you could effectively, what they would do is they would go to the operators and just do a sort of a, a deal with them so that they can manage some of that roaming data traffic, right? So if you were roaming, you could get a better deal than the sort of the quite punitive charges that an operator would normally charge, right? Right, because as I was saying earlier, right, or a couple of weeks ago, I've never seen, I've never seen the schema of like how a mobile telecom operator worked. I didn't know. Right? So I just figured when you came into a new country, you just started using the data right. in, the country, in the country where you were and then you just got charged like an extra cost for it, very similar to the way, you know, the bell system in the United States used to work. If you called from Connecticut to Ohio, it was just going over the same company's pipes. But for some reason, it was what they called long distance, and they just charged you extra fees for it. But the reality is that that's actually not what's happening, right? You, you log in locally. This is the way it works now. You log in locally. There's a way that they kind of confirm your login. They do some verifications, and then they send you back. This is why it's so expensive, and this is why there's so much latency. They send you back to your home network to get your data, right? So it's really interesting, and I, I never even thought about it and didn't know about it. But, yeah, what they're doing is they're putting a box here, and that box is saying, okay, just for our travelers, just for people coming in, visitors, right? We're going to have a new register. It's going to connect directly to this network. It's going to get authorized. It's going to bypass rid of all of our roaming agreements, which is why it gets kind of technically complicated, right, and, and slightly legally complicated, but all these things, you can get around them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the data is faster. It's more consistent, mm -hmm. and there's less latency. And that's one of the things that makes this business so interesting to me. But again, 
now I can actually have this conversation and I can look at a schema and if I'm talking to somebody at the mobile operator or an investor who's thinking about investing in this business, I can casually have a conversation about this and probably get 70% or 80% of it right, which is 70% more than I could have gotten right a month ago. Mm-hmm. Right? And every day that I spend with Alexi and I spend almost I spend a couple of hours with him every day now because whenever I'm working with a particular company and I'm working with Alexi to help him on a bunch of things right now, but whenever I work with a company like that very specifically, I spend at least a couple of hours every day with them. And like I said, today was 11 to 1 or 11 to 1.30. Just going over a bunch of things. I was giving him essentially a punch list. And we can talk about this too, right? One of the big things that these companies need to know, and this gets back to one of the things you and I talked about months a couple of months ago, and that was you know, how to raise money and what were the important things to raise mm-hmm. money, right? We talked about the five important things and we still, you know, have people do that and listen to, listen to that um, masterclass. But to get into slightly more detail, I went over an entire due diligence list with him, heavily detailed, right, which we break out down into um, individual folders and create like a data room for him so that from now on when he gets introduced to a venture capitalist, high net worth individual, or even an institutional investor, all of the data is pre-organized. And we know before we go and talk to a, pot- a potential investor that all of the data is already um, well organized and that everybody gets the same thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Because even though there are no laws around um, data dissemination like there are in the listed markets, we want to make sure that we're dealing on an even playing field and that every investor sees the same information. And one of the things we talked about today that is on that um, investor checklist was I like to create a, a Q&A, right? So, and I like to consolidate it. So every investor will ask questions. There's overlap, right? So a lot of the investors will ask the same questions. But because everybody has their own perspective, some of them will ask different questions. But we think it's fair that as an investor talking to a founder, you shouldn't have to come up with all the questions. I like to go back to them and say, here are some other things that other people have asked and you should actually know the answer to that. So the other, one of the other things we spent time talking about today was, um, you know, what does that Q and A include? How does that, how does it look? Here's some sort of redacted samples of some Q and A stuff we've looked at in the past. And we spent a lot of time today going over what that due diligence checklist is and should look like. And again, that was the first time he had been exposed to all of those things. He's been working on this for a little bit of time on his own, but it's good to get things in order. And we actually started going to a few investors already, and we'll finish out going to a bunch of them this week and next. But just having that data room ready for them is really important. And that's something that he learned today, but again, it's something that I get to give away when I'm working with somebody. But again, just to get back to the whole concept of what we're talking about today, something completely different than... When I was speaking with Alice this morning about Social Giver, I'd have a completely different conversation with Trip Ally. And remember, while Alice was brought up all over the world, right, she's Thai. Right? So she views things from a particularly Thai perspective. And some of the other people in the meeting as well were also Thai. So that part of the morning was Thai. The next part of my morning was with a guy from Russia. And then we can just move on to an, a couple of other things that I, that I did today, right? So I took a little bit of a break from the startup world, and then I worked with a couple of guys from New York on some real estate deals. So I don't really want to go into too much detail on that, but again, it's just a nice break from just startups and tech all the time. But it, again, it's the way I like to work. I get to be exposed to a whole bunch of different things. Every day gets to be different, right? Real estate and, in New York or new real estate in Bangkok? No, no, real estate in the United States. right. Yeah, I'm happy to go through it with you if you're interested. Well, I'm a real estate guy, but I mean, I like the the perspective of you know because they think differently, right? Real estate investors and tech investors, they they you know they've got different rules and different a game that they're playing. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, right? But they can learn a lot from each other for sure. Yeah, and that, but again, that's the point, though, right? So a real estate investment can be looked at in multiple ways, right? So what's the return on a real estate investment? Well, are you lending money? Are you developing from scratch? And you know this way better than I do, right? But if you're buying an existing property, you may be looking at what's the yield, mm. right? So I buy a property. I don't live there. I rent it out. This is very simplistic, right? What's the yield that I'm getting? 
right? So if it's a if it's a hundred thousand dollar property and I get eight thousand dollars of revenue year, I get an eight percent simple yield, right? And the comparisons t- for that type of deal are in some cases, right? We like to look at comps, right? So comparisons. What can I get if I just leave my money in the bank? What can get? What what kind of return can I get if I just take a government bond, which is essentially guaranteed, depending on which country you're looking at? What's the spread for a corporate bond over a government bond? What are the returns there? And how does how do I get compensated for the risk I'm taking? Because corporations need to earn money; they can't tax people to get revenue, which is what most governments can do, right? And then you go to high yield bonds. Again, this is all very simplified, right? But Then you go to high yield bonds, which are saying, here's a developing company. It's almost like raising capital in the non-listed markets, right? It's almost not like an IPO, but it's like raising money from investors in in um, in the startup world. Those people want to get a much higher return. So their comps are completely different. But you're right. All the things that I learn about when I talk to even social giver and about the return basis for the socially responsible companies. I talk about the disintermediating the mobile business. What's the return going to be like there? How big do we think that business can be, right? So how many people can potentially use it? What are they willing to pay for it? What's going to be my return on investment? All of those are very similar questions that I can transition to nice and easily when I go and sit down to talk about somebody from on the real estate space. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think? So when you look at I know it's it's a little bit off topic, but when you look at a real estate deal simplistically, right? We, I don't want to get into structured deals, but what do you use for comps if you're wondering should I invest this money in real estate or should I invest it in another sort of um, sort of return earning asset? Mm. I mean, I'm a I'm a fundamentals guy. I like looking at the fundamentals. So which I, means what? Well, so for example, if you would take a real estate, you know, let's take for example Japan as an example. The basic fundamentals of population we talked about this before you know 125 million people going down to 85 million people so 40 million people out of the market over 30 years 40 years i mean to me regardless of the the you know the current yields on properties here in japan i think well this is not sustainable right right because you know in five ten years there's going to be a flood of properties which are going to be empty so i'm always interested in fundamentals which is kind of i mean i know they're boring by comparison to the startup world right but you know that's what i like i like that stuff and you know that kind of i'm always sort of thinking well you know 100 years from now will there be a facebook i don't know will there be a snapchat i don't know but i know for sure i know for sure right we know people are going to need places to live Right. right, we know that for sure. So that's, I mean, you know, that's what I look for. And you know, when I look for comparisons in other asset classes, so to speak, you know, I'm always looking at fundamentals. You know, because it's kind of like, I mean, there's a lot of hype, as you know, surrounding all these different investments. So that always sort of, you know, I'm always very sort of cautious. Yeah, and I guess what you're saying is, at some level, is you're always taking a long view as well, right? Because those fundamentals can fluctuate really. Interestingly, over time, when you talk about exactly. Japan, right? in 2011, there was an earthquake. Property values were actually rising quite nicely, but slowly in, in, let's say, Tokyo. The earthquake destroyed everything, and it just started to come back like last year or the year before. But that's market timing, and right, I don't right. think that that's a great way to invest, frankly. Right. No, I mean, you've got to be in long term, haven't you? I mean, you've got to be able to sit things out for the long term. You can't, you've got to be in five plus years to make money out of property anyway, right? So. Yeah, it's agreed. a different sort of time frame. I mean, that's the that's the sort of comparing the kind of investors who are successful in the startup world. They can't go in with that kind of attitude, right? I mean, they could look at fundamentals, but as you probably know, they're playing a different game, right? They want to be out within five years, right? Right. And this brings up another topic that I talk about a lot, and that's asset allocation, right? In other words, for every million dollars you invest, you don't want to put it all in one place, right? Mm-hmm. You want to allocate it to... You know, let's just call it things that you can are relatively safe. So just a fixed income investment where you know over the next five years what you're going to earn. It's not guaranteed, but it feels pretty close to guaranteed. Right. Two is the stock market. You want to be in the stock market for a lot longer than five years because money you invest in the stock market historically, at least in Western stock markets, has earned a return of about 8%. Right. So you have to make a decision how much money you're going to allocate to those assets. Now you want to start moving up the risk curve and say, Okay, what do I want? Where do I want to put my alternative investment money? 
do I want to put that into a hedge fund? Right? What's the difference between a hedge fund and a regular investment? And that is you can buy assets and sell assets against them to raise money to buy the assets, right? Mm-hmm. So your your net cash flat in most cases, sometimes you're you know, 100, 130, we, it's too technical, but you're funding your purchases with things that you're borrowing and selling. How much money do you want to allocate that? And then you can move even further down the curve, and that's into really high-yield investments, and that also includes startup companies, right? So one of the things, just to get back to, you know, what, what was I doing today type of things, and why do I love doing this, is because I get to have these types of conversations as well. Mm. Right? When I talk to investors about what they're investing in, they say, do you think I should put my 500000 or a million dollars or $2 million into this investment? I like to talk about the risks that are also associated with it, right? The incumbent risks that are associated with it. And I try to understand what their asset allocations are to make sure that even if they desperately want to invest in something, that it actually makes sense for them to do it as well. And this comes straight out of sort of years of listening to KYC speeches. So know your customer Mm -hmm. speeches at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. And that's where that kind of training comes in really handy because I don't want to see someone take their last $500,000 and lose it because they wanted outsized returns. I want to make sure yeah. that their investment expectations are, um, are heavily related to what they're likely to win or lose based on making that investment, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. You know, this whole idea of, you know, working between different industries, I mean, like what you were doing today, you're, you're talking to startups, you're talking to very technical startups, people in the, the social space, and you're talking mm-hmm. to real estate investors. I'm just curious about the transferable knowledge there. I mean, if you, if you were to sort of take the best real estate investors, the best startup investors, the best startup entrepreneurs, and you switch them around, so you've got the real estate investors to invest in startups, and you've got the startup investors to invest in real estate. I'm just curious to know from being of the position where you're in, where you can see from the outside and you've got this sort of transferable knowledge, how would those people do in each industry? Do you think they would, the best real estate investors would be successful in startups and vice versa? Do you think it's that transferable? Is there sort of a common core which you see when you sort of work between all these different industries? I, I, I hate to do this, but I think the answer is yes and no, right? Because it, de- it really depends on the individual investor. But I think the biggest lesson you can learn when you're making any type of investment is risk management. And I think if you understand the risk management side of making that investment, then your ability to determine what the risks are and what the returns are should be pretty strong, right? So again, I was talking to somebody else about this yesterday or the day before. The, the whole idea is that everything in the world is related, everything is related to finance and technology, right? And why is that? Even somebody who's doing barter has to understand what am I giving you and what am I getting in return? And at some level, that's finance related. So if you can understand Mm. the balance sheet and the income statement for a real estate investment, and you can do pro forma analyses and projections for a startup company, and you can make sure that those projections are reasonable and you understand the risks that are associated with it, it's very similar to you know, going into the west coast of Myanmar where there are no resort hotels and saying, this is a beautiful piece of land on a beautiful beach. People will come here. I'm going to build this, and here are my expected returns. Mm-hmm. Right? There's no difference. Well, not no difference, but there's a small difference really between building a startup that you don't know if anybody's going to use and building a hotel on a brand new piece of property in a country that no one's traveled to before for whatever the specified or implied dangers had been. But as long as you understand, like you said, the fundamentals of that market, right? and this gets back to the thing that I like to talk about when making investments, right? And here's where the, here's part of the commonality, right? Is are you investing in a product that everybody needs, or do I need to convince people out of nowhere that they need this product, right? right. So, you know, the iPhone was the perfect example of this. Do you want a computer in your pocket? Yeah, I think most people are going to want that, even if they're not asking for it. Right. This was the big Steve Jobs trope. And that was, you know, I don't want to do consumer studies because they don't know what they want. They only know after I tell them. To a certain extent, that could be true. But the whole concept is people will need this. Right. It doesn't mean that you can't invest in a business for things that people don't need. Right. Like Instagram, if the world just like died tomorrow and Instagram wasn't there, nobody would care, really. 
But when you travel right now, you need mobile data, full stop. You just need it because there's no other way you can communicate with mm. your family, your friends, your home office, and all the things you want to do require you have access to data. They just do. Okay, so I don't need to go out and convince people that you need mobile data. I don't need, in, in reverse, I don't need to go out and convince people that there's excess into corporations and that that excess can be used for social good. I don't need to really convince people about that. They can see it pretty much themselves. I need to give them a proper platform to do it. But I do think, as you were saying earlier, that you can take investors from disparate verticals and switch them around. And in enough time, if they're really great investors, really great, right, they should be able to figure it out. Right. I think it was Warren Buffett who said, you know, I don't like to invest in technology because it's too complicated and I don't really understand it that well. Um, and yet he went out and bought a decent chunk in Apple. Right, exactly. Right, at when that was uh, in trouble. And he also, during the financial crisis, he went out and bought a massive position, a $5 billion position in Goldman Sachs. Yep. Did that for two reasons. One, just to tell the market everything's going to be okay. But two, because in a very complex business, very complex business, he saw an opportunity, okay? But just like you talked about with the fundamentals, when he went out and bought, um, I forget the name of the railroad company that he bought, but the whole idea was goods, and, goods are still going to move around the economy, and the most efficient and easiest way to move them around is not by plane, it's not by truck, it's on fixed rail. And he went out and bought a railroad company. It's one of the best investments he's made recently. I mean, that's recently. It's probably 15 or 20 years ago. But the whole idea was he just looked at ongoing fundamentals. It didn't matter if it was e-commerce, or regular retail, someone's going to bring something to a port and have to ship it somewhere else. And if that, if the economy is going to grow, then rail traffic is going to grow. Mm. And he wanted to, he wanted to run because that's a network. It's just like the internet in a way. He wanted to be part of it. So yeah, I do think there are things, that, there are transferable skills from an investment standpoint, from one realm to another. And I think the biggest one, like I said, is risk management. But the other one is like just understanding where you think things are going to go. And maybe that gets back to your fundamentals. What do people need? Mm -hmm. And how is that going to um, manifest itself? And those are the things in which you like to invest. Yeah. Well, that's really fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating from the perspective of being able to sort of move between these different sectors, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned a conversation that you had with the lady from Social Giver, right? I mean, you yep. saw something that she didn't see. Right. And that's something that I mean, I see that from time to time when I talk to people about their business. And so I'm interviewing somebody for a podcast. Right. I mean, I yep. say, oh, this is what you do. And I explain their business back to them. And it's often the first time. And they say, oh, wow, I never heard it like that. Right. But that's the kind of benefit of being on the outside looking in. Right. I mean, you have that sort of you see these patterns in different industries. Right. And then you're able to relate it back to them. And often people are so busy in their own domain. Right. That they can't explain something in terms which makes sense to other people right because they're so focused on a product and they're so surrounded by the terminology of their industry but it takes somebody to come from the outside and say oh it means this right you know in a way that's kind of like going back to steve jobs talking about the computer in your pocket right yep. or you know he like the like he explained the imac and stuff like that you know it was always done in terms which technologists wouldn't use right no, 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 no. being a generalist right so i think there's a real skill in having that sort of joining the dots experience right i agree i love connecting the dots and i kind of left that meeting this morning just thinking it's just so much fun for me or just being able to do all those things in, in one day like when the day is over i get to sit around and think you know, besides, wow, I just can't believe what I learned today. And I cannot believe the people that I get to meet on a daily basis and the new ideas to which I get exposed so often. But just having those conversations makes you think. Like it makes you think all the time. And you're right, being able to apply things from one industry to another industry, just fascinating. And also the cultural things. So I want to mention, and we can do this quickly and then we can get on to sort of the final stage of the conversation. But you know, we started with Social Givers, so the two founders there are Thai. Then we moved on to Trip, Trip Ally, and the Trip Ally are the four founders there, even though they're living in Southeast Asia, they're all Russian. So completely different interactions, right? Mm. Completely different discussions, completely different way of perceiving and going about things. The UTN team, we've talked about them as well, and we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about their business necessarily, right? But I spent four months with them on a very frequent basis, and even now I still do. But these are two founders from Norway. Okay, so the Norwegians are very different than the Thais. Yeah, yeah. The Thais are very different than the Russians. 
And so it's not only just switching business verticals and switching different domains and realms. It's really just switching cultures as well. And then the best is like my day ends, not ends, right? Because I'm talking to you. But again, you know, I'm American, you're English. So it's just, just constantly changing. Mm-hmm. I also talked to a guy from a company called Udin. And Udin is really building a platform again that's going to virtualize sales. We can talk about that under separate cover. I really love that business too. But he's from Finland. Mm. Okay, so today I deal with England, Finland, Russia, <laughs> Thailand, and Norway. Right. It's, but it's because a, you're so many, you're dealing with so many. In a way, you're sort of joining the dots between all of these and seeing a common. I know you say they're different, but there's a commonality as well, isn't there? Which you're dealing yeah. with entrepreneurs or investors who, within their own cultures, probably have more in common with you than people within their own country, right? Potentially, right, because of the the verticals in which we're dealing, right? Right. Fascinating to me. But again, if I can deal with a telecoms company, right, or someone's trying to distribute telecoms, and then I talk to somebody who's using the internet backbone to do things, here's the perfect example, okay? And this is why today was beautiful for me. And this really was the genesis of all these thoughts, is that the two Norwegian guys, right, are really great guys. They're building a great company, and we recently got them funded. I know I've said that a thousand times, but I know them really well, Okay. Then the the Russians are building something in the mobile space. Now it turns out that one of the biggest investors in mobile companies, not just in the region but in the world, is Telenor. It turns mm. out that Telenor yeah. is a Norwegian company. Why does that matter? Well, here's the dot connections, right? So Telenor is I mean not Telenor, but Norway is a country of five and a half million people. So and, and that includes everybody, right? So if you take, talk about like the work age adults, I don't know how many it is, 50% of that, two and a half million people. If you talk about senior management, now you're getting down to like 700,000 people. Super senior management, you know, 200,000 people. Like the universe is small. So if you can connect dots between mobile telecoms, tele, like all these things and put them together and say, hey, Tom, can you tell Sergey whatever to meet this guy, Bill? It just yeah. that all works, and they would never know each other otherwise. And I love doing that. Right, and I, I mean, my experience with—I te- mean, I've worked a lot with Telenor over the years, and people who work for Telenor, maybe it's a Norwegian thing, or they stick with Telenor throughout their career, right? Which yeah, is sort of so do. rare in this day and age. I mean, people will work for Telenor for twenty, thirty years, and it's a global company as well. I mean, it's everywhere. It's you know, it's got yeah. like ownership in like DTAC, and it's in Pakistan, D-tac. Bangladesh, and everywhere, right? So. Yes, it is. And okay, and we can we can do this. So I bet if I ask a normal person like, how big is Bangladesh, right? And tell me important. Tell me an important internet company in Bangladesh. They just draw a blank, right? Right. And I won't do the thing to you. Is do you know this that? But like Bangladesh is a really large, high population com- country, and it actually has a very successful and very vibrant startup scene there. And Chaldal is the biggest um, online retailer, which started in the grocery sector because everybody buys groceries and they're branching out. They wanna be the biggest e-commerce company in Bangladesh. And I was introduced to the founder like three years ago. Mm. So that's again, just connecting the dots. I wouldn't know anything about Bangladesh. And there's nothing wrong with it, but it just sits in a place that's kind of squeezed in between a bunch of other really large countries. So it kind of gets missed sometimes, but. I just bumped into the guy one day. I heard about his company, and I've been following it for the past three or four years. But again, it's just the luck of what I get to do every single day. Now, with what you're doing, Michael, my question for you is this, is that how do you consciously go about making value out of that network, those dots? Because you know, it's something I think about as well from time to time. You can build up a really valuable network in different industries. Mm-hmm. And it might not be obvious how these guys over here connect with these guys over there. And, you know, this meeting from three years ago, and you can easily forget about this stuff. How are you consciously going about that? Because I can imagine there's listeners who have extensive networks and, you know, they have experience that they've built out over the years. You know, it's it's a very sort of fuzzy, intangible value, isn't it? That you can know all these different industries and different companies and so on. How are you consciously going about that and saying, right, there's value here. I can connect these people and so on. Are you actually sort of going back through your Rolodex and scanning through this stuff? Or are you, you sort of approaching meetings with some different kind of angle to the, 
the average person doing this? So it's a really good question. I like to be as organized as humanly possible. And when I'm organized, it means that I write things down. And I actually still like to take physical notes. So when I'm in a meeting, I may take out a pen. And that pen may be digital, right? But I do write with my hand. I don't often take most of my notes mm. on a keyboard because I feel like my brain doesn't register everything that I'm typing, but it will register everything that I'm writing. And at the end of the day, I will go through everything that I've done. So I do what we're doing on the phone right now kind of at the end of every day is who did I meet today? Why did it matter? What did I learn? And how can I apply that to something else? And if I have kind of an epiphany moment where I'm like, wait a second, they're doing this thing and that's going to help that other team, I'll make a note to myself. And I actually put it in my calendar. Mm. You know how like you have this place in your calendar for like an all-day event? I just put a note in my calendar. Make sure you connect these people. And if I don't do it on Tuesday, I'll move it to Wednesday. And if I don't do it on Wednesday, I move it to Thursday. So I don't keep a to-do list per se. But I keep it in the calendar because it's something that I look at every single day. And if you go and look at my calendar for any specific day, the time is like perfectly blocked out. Like almost nothing that I do is by chance. And the other thing that I've done is so, <clears throat> again, a really great, great question. But I spent three or four years kind of building up this network and then stopped and took stock of it and said, okay, how can I best benefit everybody else who's in this network right. by using that connectivity? And how can I get more focused on to whom I speak and what I do? Right. So that's my, uh, that's my way of sort of trying to generate business from that, but also help other businesses do it. It's a very um, targeted thing. So I made a decision at the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017 really to focus on basically five things only. So in any particular business in which I operate, I only want to do five things there because I can't physically do more. And if I do, and every now and then I'll try, I'll go to six or I'll go to seven and everything else kind of falls off the cliff. But five seems to be the number where if I'm focusing on those things, then I can get a lot done and I can be really helpful to other people. And I can still sort of keep the network going and building bit by bit. But most of the work, most of that work is not done, but the base is there, right? And building that base is really important. And now that the base has been built, I can use that base to sort of grow my own personal business, but also to be able to help people inside that network mm. to, to grow their businesses as well. And I find that, again, just being organized and having a plan every single day about what you're going to do means that I can be super productive. We talked about this at the beginning, right? I, I try to build kind of automated things into everything that I do so that I know exactly where I need to be. I know exactly what I want to get done. And at the end of the week, if I haven't done it, I try to catch up so that by the time the next week starts, I start as fresh as I possibly can. And I don't always achieve that, but that's always the goal, right? Hmm. I'm curious about that bit where you talk about those five things. You Just to sort of rewind that a little bit, you said that you build up this network like all these people you've been meeting today and over, over the last few years. And then you sort of stepped out of that and took stock of it and said, right, you know, I built up this network. How do I add value to these people in this network? And you you drew up this list of five things, which you said, right, this is what I'm going to focus on from now on. What were those things that you drew up? Because I'm really curious, because that seems to like it'd be an interesting strategy if it works to what, monetize. Yes. So basically what I said was, so I run an, let's just talk about the advisory business, right? I run an advisory mentoring business. And I would essentially, if it was 2013 or 2014 or even 2015, if a startup called me, I'd go meet with them. I'd take a second meeting with them and I'd just talk to them. There was no way that that was actually going to be super effective. And I said, w okay, wait a second. Where do my core competencies lie? What do I know really well? And what don't I know so well? And what can I learn? So if I look at my list, I'm working on one, two, three, four projects right now in the startup space. Okay. I talk to other people. And remember, I'm also starting up my own company too, mm. right? And I use all the knowledge that I get from everybody else's, from all my interaction with everybody else to try to help my own business too. But I'm working on a company in the ad tech space. I'm working on a company in travel. I'm working on a company local that's getting people, taking SMEs and getting them digitally access. So a lot of companies in Southeast Asia don't have any digital presence at all. Right, so it's again, it's just a market. I don't need to convince them to do it. These companies are sitting around saying, how can I get online? How can I be discovered? I really like that business and it helps a sector that I, I believe in a lot. But again, it uses mobile first. So all the things that I know really well, I can help them. And then Udin is a company that I said is modernizing sales, right? 
is trying to use artificial intelligence to help real human salespeople do sales better outside of like a corporate environment. And I liked the model because I thought it was scalable. So I, those are the sort of the four or five things that I'm working on right now. And all of those companies are approaching things in a way that's really different from the way they've been approached in the past. And all of them teach me something too, right? We talked about what Trip Ally teaches me. We talked about what UTNE teaches me, what Udin teaches me. And there's another company that I can't mention yet, but that teaches me something too on the production side, right? About video, audio, creativity, and production there. And I talk to those guys once a week as well. Um, and I put all those things together, and my criteria is, can I really add value here based on sort of my finance and tech background? And can I learn something new here that then I can apply to some of the other companies? So again, Triple is a perfect example of this. If I see somebody else in the startup space that wants to disintermediate the travel business, they know that one of the things that their clients are going to want is data connectivity. But they don't know how to build that, but I'm already connected to it. So I can say to them, stop looking for that, stop thinking about it, but partner with these guys. It helps both of them because then they can consolidate their services together and both of them get to be bigger and they can just focus on the things that they know best as opposed to having to worry about building ancillary services. Because remember, what my main service is for me may be an ancillary service for you and vice versa. And if I'm sitting and advising both of those companies, I can convince them right away. I know someone who does that really well. Don't try to build that because they're going to build it better than you. But you should definitely partner with them. And they need you too because you have access to their potential customers, but you can't build what they're doing because it's highly technical. You should partner with them too. And when they meet each other, like, this is great. Thanks for the connectivity. But being able to do that, again, is the essence of everything that I try to do. But again, that's why I keep it small. Right. Okay. Yeah. But, the, but the other thing, sorry to interrupt you, but the other thing that's really important is I almost never, I don't want to use never and always and stuff like that, but I almost never turn down a first meeting, right? Because I don't know. I just don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the investor's like. I don't know what the founder's like. I just don't know. Even if it's in a sector that makes no sense to me, I sit there and I just listen and I try to learn and I say, okay, I can't help you now. But maybe in three months when I'm done doing this thing, I can help her. I just say, I, I really can't help you. And I met a founder like that a couple of weeks ago. You know, I had lunch with him. I gave him a ton of advice. He knows who he is. So if he's listening to this, he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, but I just said, I, I, I can't help you. And at the stage where you are, you need to do these, you know, three things, whatever they are. And if you don't do them, it's not going to matter whether I help you or not. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it sounds like we talked about before when we talked about VCs and funds, we talked about people like Benchmark as yep. a sort of a role model for yep. investors. And I think what you're doing is what many startup founders would want from a VC or some kind of investor, but often they don't deliver, do they? I mean, they all kind of think that when the investor sits on their board, they're going to get that door opening and that advice and that sort of hands-on you know, joining the dots, but it's so rarely manifest because especially with these VC partners, they're, they're so busy stretched between, you know, a, a number of different investments, right? And they, they can only spend, a, they're sort of skimming through their relationships, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Because that's their model. They have to be across, you know, like dozens and dozens of investments to make the whole thing work, right? They can't sort of be focused on five or six. So it's just interesting the way you're doing it. And that's the sort of where you you seem to be doubling down on those kind of, commitments so that you can give them a bit more quality and a bit more personal relationship which doesn't seem to be the norm in the no it doesn't world, right and, and that's part of i think every investor has to have like a differentiating factor and I'll, I'll use i'll use um one of the terms that you use right i have to look at the fundamentals but i also have to take a long view on this right you know everybody wants to get um current income but you're always making a bet, right? What's worth more to you, a dollar today or a dollar in three years? But if right. that dollar is actually $10 in three years, what kind of return do you have to earn on a dollar today to get that $10 in three years? And you have to make that calculation all the time. But the other thing that I learned when I was <clears throat> working in the world of finance, my all my previous jobs or my most recent jobs were doing portfolio trading. I believe there's an optimal size that has some kind of mathematical formula associated with it, right? So I think that you have to do portfolio management around your, um, your investments. And you can make a case that you should invest in the Russell 2000 or a Vanguard mutual fund, right, which is an index investment. 
I think that takes more maturity in the market. There has to be an index in which you can invest or you can curate your investments, which I think is the right stage to be right now. And that's kind of where I, how I like to handle my what I call portfolio optimization and portfolio management. Mm. I choose the companies that I advise very carefully, almost as if I am an investor, because we talked about this as well. I treat them as if I'm an investor in that company. Mm. So, yeah, that's the, that's the model that I use. I think it's highly differentiated from the way most people do it. They invest in 150 companies. They say they'll help them all, and they can't. Right. Right. They don't meet the expectations, do they? And that's the problem. No, they can't do it. And then they don't realize what each one of those individual companies is doing. But if you want to go through like the list of projects that I'm working on right now, I can pretty much tell you, it, like if, if the CEO had a problem and walked away, but the company was still viable, I could probably run like three or four of these things. Right. Right. Because they've shared so much information with me, not because I'm some kind of superstar. It's not like I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the relationship that I have and the depth with which I try to understand these companies. That's really important to me, actually. And one of the things I talk about when I help raise capital for them is even I want to understand this business so well that even if you cannot be at that meeting, I can be your proxy mm-hmm. and I can answer all the questions in the same way that you could. It's highly differentiated and I like doing it. Mm-hmm. So what? just out of interest, what kind of an investor does it take to make that work? Because there must be a lot of people out there who are angel investors, want to be angel investors, people sort of floating in, in that scene who have either success or experience of being involved with startups, but maybe don't know what is the best model or the best way that suits their personality, right? Because I think, you know, investments match personalities. That's really important, right? Not everybody yeah. is a good real estate investor. Not everybody is a good VC. Not everybody is good angel investors, right? So what does it take to make that kind of business work, what you're doing? It's just your, your comfort. What's your comfort with risk, right? What is your comfort with risk? Like, you, there's a whole bunch of things in the startup world you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. And even if you think you know what's going to happen, it's five years out. And in that five years, you know, everything can be going your way, everything can be going against you, and then swing back into your favor. You just don't know what it is, and you have to have an ability to deal with risk and just be comfortable with that risk. So it's you, I think it's really, what's your comfort level? Like, how much of the unknown are you willing to deal with? And how can you sort of qualify what type of unknowns you're willing to deal with? That's really important. I talked to people that want to be seed investors, people that want to be late sort of seed stage investors all the time. And we talked about this in another context, but they'll say, I won't invest in this until I see more traction. And and my response is always, you're not really qualified or comfortable to be a seed investor because by definition it has no traction. That's just one example of it. We could talk about many examples, but the answer to that is, what's your comfort level with risk? That's it. And most people are very uncomfortable with it. It doesn't mean you know, that they haven't taken risks before, but the risks that they take have outcomes that they understand. Right. There's a difference, right. isn't there? I mean, if you're an entrepreneur building a business, that's a risk. But, you know, being an entrepreneur who's then willing to lose 100000 of their own money, that's a different level of risk, isn't it? So they, they may yeah, be and, comfortable with one and not the other. Right, and not moan about it, right? I mean, you know, we talked about this a lot. My first couple of investments in the startup world did not go well. Mm. We don't spend a lot of time moaning about it, but what we do is we do um, a postmortem and we learn. Yeah. Again, I say this all the time. You cannot be half pregnant, right? And what does that mean? It means <laughs> if your first three investments go poorly and then you say, that's it, I'm not investing in this stuff anymore, well, then you've lost and you've locked in your loss and you're guaranteed that you're going to be a person who's always lost at investing in a certain asset. Right. But if you sort of take a step back and say, okay, what did I do wrong? What can I learn? How can I invest better going forward? It's just a process, right? So people that say that their first investment was Twitter or Facebook or whatever, they know and they'll tell you that was really lucky. Yeah. But they still try to do a postmortem and try to fig- think about why did this work? What did I learn and how can I replicate that? And that gets back to this whole concept of risk management as well. It's fascinating. And there's, there's one thing that you do, which I really, you know, admire is that you, you are involved in projects which are, are very multinational. I mean, you talked about the Russians and the Thais and the Finns and the Norwegians and so on. That seems to be a, a recurring theme in what you do. And I wonder as well, is that, you know, is there something there? Because 
you know, it's like in sales. I mean, I was a sales guy. We talked about your experience, you know, selling, whether that was sort of before where you were doing the car, I think the insurance company, I can't remember the exact story, but we talked about it in the other issue, right? But, you know, whatever it is, is that I think you, you attract a kind of customer or a kind of client that is emotionally on a similar kind of level to you. But there's this sort of common riff in the kind of deals that you're involved in where these people are sort of from the outside, from different countries, right? Moving across different boundaries and so on. So that, that's a really fascinating theme and something I can never really put my finger on, but it's something that you're involved in. So I'm wondering how you see it and how you sort of articulate what you're doing there. Again, it's just, it's my comfort with the unknown. It's really important to me to expose myself to things that I don't understand, right? And it kind of gets back to my very early days when I first moved to Japan. There were two types of foreigners that went to Japan in the early 1990s and before that, right? But two types that I saw, ones with an open mind and ones with a closed mind, right? The people that went to Japan and said, why don't the Japanese, and this is true for any country, right? It would have been the same in France if we'd all been in France, right? And the questions would have been different, but right. the types of questions would have been the same. And they went something like this, right? Why don't the Japanese just start using a fork and a knife? It's so much easier. I don't understand the chopsticks. Like, I don't understand it. Whereas what I would look at and say, sheesh, I wonder if I'm using these chopsticks properly and what right. can I do to better about how to become more knowledgeable about this local thing? Because the more I know, the more that I can apply whatever that learning is, mm. again, connecting the dots to things that don't seem related but are super related. Mm. Right? So for me, any exposure that I can have, like you can, make, you can make generalizations. We used to do this as a joke when we were kids about any you know, group of people. Put them in any category you want. You can make those because those are the most prominent features of those people, whatever they are. Or you can sit around and say, I'm going to get over what I like to call the other side of the mountain mentality and just go to the other side of the mountain and see what they're doing there because maybe they're farming better than you are. Maybe they're raising their livestock better than you are or maybe they're just building better technology than you are. And to me, when I can meet people from different places and different countries, all it is is a massive – it's like paying no tuition and getting to go to grad school. Right. But that's yeah. the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah. But you've got to sort of – I mean you talk about meeting people – but you've, you've got to sort of step outside your own or step off your own turf first, haven't you? You've got to leave that stuff yeah. behind to be able to meet them, right? Yes, I do. Fascinating. I do. And also, it's not just – you and I talked about this. Our previous two episodes were like female entrepreneurs and yeah. you know women in tech and women in Asia. I think it's really important. And I talked about this a couple of weeks ago at the Aiken Asia meeting, and that was, you know, you have to look at things from you know both genders – and multiple cultures. If you can do that, the benefit to you is almost better than the benefit to the people that you don't know. For sure. Because because I'm doing it on purpose. Like I'm actively seeking that out. What can I learn from these people? Right. right? But you're putting yourself out of your comfort zone though. That's the fascinating thing, isn't it? Because that's kind yeah. of, you're, in a way, if I use the word naked and vulnerable, right? But that's kind of that's where you really feel. learn, right? I mean, it's like how you learn a language. You only learn when you get out there and you walk into the store and ask for something and make a fool of yourself. Right. You know, but this, you, you make a really important point. And I don't want to take up too much more of your time tonight because we've been talking for a while, but I learned actually, you know, you see little kids, two year old, two year olds and three year olds, you have children, you know this, right? They'll just come out with words. They don't know what they mean, but it, and sometimes those words are bad. Yeah. But they're that. just test. They're just, no, but, and you've seen it. I've seen yeah, it as yeah. well. I remember dude, they'll say whatever that word is and just wait to see what the reaction is. And they're not trying to, be, you know, pissy or impish. They're just going. I wonder if that means what I think it is, and there's no way to know until right. I test it. And that's kind of the way I look at this too. I yeah. sit in a room filled with Russians or a room filled with women or people that I just in cultures that I don't know. I sat in the room with these Norwegian guys for the first time, and I was like, I have no idea what I'm up against. Now I kind of know. I don't know. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, definitely love it. Oh, there was so much more to talk about. It is, it is. But we got to do the surprise. The uh, That's a big surprise this week because it's quite a big one, isn't there? It is. It's long. I mean, it just depends on how much time you have. Look, I think there's no big, I think there's no big surprise. It's a little bit outside of our normal realm, right? But, right. you know, the world has been going after Uber management for over a year now, right? Whether it's a sex scandal or going to a club in Korea or all the things that they've kind of um, – 
you know, built through the culture of that company. And I wonder a bunch of things about it. I'm not making excuses for anybody, right? I don't make excuses for bad behavior at any level. Um, but I wonder, and I want to throw it out there, like, if the Rockefellers or the Carnegies or the Mellons who built their companies, you know, between 1830 and 1870, whenever it was, had to be open to the same level of Twitter scrutiny or Facebook scrutiny or fake news or just any of the stuff that we have to go through today, would they have ever been able to survive with their own companies and build it, right? Yeah. You saw Carnegie in the middle of building U.S. Steel woke up one day and was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe what I'm – I'm going back to – where was he from? Ireland or whatever. Like Scottish, I got to get out of here yeah. from Scotland. I got to go back to Scotland for a while because – What's going on in some of those plants is really driving me nuts. I'm going to leave that for that guy Frick to do because he seems to be pretty happy doing it. <laughs> kind of kind of thing, right? Right. But now you have – this is really interesting. But now you have, you know, Kalnick and he had a tragedy with his mother got killed in a yeah, boat yeah. accident. Yeah. Something like that. So it's all like coming together. But look at who's like kind of taking over. You go and you read the New York Times and you see Ariana Huffington, right? So the founder of the Huffington Post. Yep. But look at the look at the Motley crew that founded the Huff Post with her. Yeah, exactly. So Andrew Breitbart, who's I believe has passed away. Yeah, yeah. Right? But he was the founder of Breitbart News, which frankly, when it was founded, wasn't kind of what it is today. Yeah. Ken Ken Lair, right, who has been if you listen to the man talk, I think I might have mentioned him last week, a completely even handed, even minded, deeply intellectual, very private man was also the founder there. And then Jonah Peretti, Jonah's the founder of BuzzFeed, and he was at the Huff, what they call HuffPo, right? And was working on BuzzFeed, which is a new way to sort of distribute media for a while. And they were like, yeah, go do that. It's fine. Because you're going to do go do it on your own. You might as well go do it. But I think it's interesting that Ariana Huffington is now starting to have a whole bunch of influence yeah. on on the Uber company. And like I said, we could probably do multiple episodes on that. But I don't think it's a big surprise that with all the things that were going on in senior management, that Kalanick is kind of going to be out, even if they say he's not. Um, but something had to happen, right? It's right. a company that's like almost overfollowed in a way. Yeah. Well, isn't it? Isn't it funny? Isn't it? I mean, we talk about a technology industry. We talk about you know the billions that this company is involved with, just in terms of valuation and investments and so on, and all the kind of business models that hang off that company. We talk about Uber Eats and all this kind of stuff, right? Yep. At the end of the day, it just comes down to one guy and his personality because that's really the root of, well, I mean, the way I see it is, you know, I've seen this guy talk. I've seen how this guy behaves like in public and, you know, no issue with the way he behaves, but he has a certain manner which I guess has reflected that DNA has just reflected in his sort of, you know, his first inner circle and then their inner circle and so on, right? That's sort of propagated throughout. And then you, I mean, you sort of compare that to somebody like Steve Jobs. I know he's sort of, he's the sort of the Teflon man, right? Nothing sticks to him, right? If you compare Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, you know, one guy is held as a genius, yet one guy has donated virtually all his billions to charity and, and it is, you know, and Bill Gates can't do anything right. Right. You know, it's just right. how much it comes down to personality. I think Travis Kalanick falls into that sort of Bill Gates category, but just, he's got a sort of a, I don't know. He, he doesn't have a likable personality like a Steve Jobs. Right. And I'm, so my point is with all that technology and all those billions at the end of the day, it comes down to something very, very basic. Yeah. And I, but here's the thing. I just, the, I want to get back to the basic question for me, and that is, I wonder if that company, which, remember, had to fight regulators in every city in the United States, in every country in which it um, in which it had, you know, a, more startup operations, whether it went to right. Germany and had problems in Berlin or in South Africa or in Australia or even in Thailand, anywhere in the world where it went there and the regulators said, you can't do this because you're not this kind of thing or that kind of thing, and he just said, I'm running you over. Screw you. Like, right. I just don't care. I'm just running you over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you it needed that personality, want. right? You, well, you couldn't have done it otherwise, right? Because look at some of the other companies that came in the wake. There would be no Grab without Uber. There would right. be no Lyft without Uber. And you can say Lyft was started beforehand, but it's much smaller, right? right. So they benefited from – he basically created a wake. You know what a wake is, right? It's like yeah. when you water – that that part of the, the – the water that gets spread out. He created that wake and everybody's just skiing Coming in it. Right, yeah. And it's easy for them to complain. But the bottom line is like sometimes it takes that that type of person, you know, to build U.S. Steel or to build the Mellon yeah. Banking Empire, so that other other people can thrive. Uh, again, I'm not I'm not um, suggesting or apologizing for bad behavior, but I'm just saying like 
what it's needed, right? Yeah. But sometimes it's like sometimes that happens, and you know, back in the day, Steve Jobs took a lot of flack as well. It's interesting to me, like how some people go from like, um, you know, really poorly like person to a saint. Yeah. Over their career, you can change, or just the perception of you can change. What you had to do to get somewhere to do it and to build something big, and today I think. We, we forget the fact that it's like 24 hour seven analysis on not just the company that you've built, but on the personality that, that helped build it as well. So I don't think yeah. it's a big surprise that he's going to be out and that someone like Ariana Huffington is going to be in. And you saw recently they also hired um, that woman. Nestle? Yeah, no, well, the woman that was working at Apple, the, the Nestle woman was on the board, right? But this uh, woman, um, Bozama A. St. John, was a very uh, prominent um, female woman of color at Apple, and she has moved to Uber. Mm-hmm. As well, I believe, right? To be what is it, the head of something there? So again, they're going to put an impressive team there. I don't believe that this company is going to go away. I think there are plenty of people that are trying to build a career based on saying it's a Ponzi scheme and things like that. But I think it's going to take way more than that. There are secular things in their favor that says this is not going to go away. Yeah, so. it's going to take another Travis Kalanick though to take it forward. I can't see an Ariana Huffington making that work. I don't think she's got the right temperament. Well, no, I mean, she spent a lot of her life building consensus, right? But this, exactly. is not a, this is not a business that needs consensus building. Like may, maybe if Mike Arrington was running this, he's yeah. the old tech crunch guy. That's yeah, not a yeah. guy that's very famous for building consensus. He was just, again, I'll, run, I'll build it, I'll run you over. Um, again, you, sometimes you need that. Watch this space. Precisely. Yeah. I thought we were going to talk about Amazon, but then maybe that's another time. Amazon and Whole Foods, but... There you go. Oh, I can't wait to I cannot wait to talk about it. Let's do that. Let's do that next week. The market's gonna try to figure out what that means. Yeah. We you yeah. look, you and I talked about it offline. I have a really strong view on that. And again, that I don't want to spend too much time on it now, but that gets back to some of this real estate stuff that I'm working on too. The yeah, reason exactly. why I understand that is because I get the real estate space and the retail space in the United States completely, and I know how that's gonna work. Anyway, let's end with that. Yeah. Let's say you can find us at asiatechpodcast.com. Come um, subscribe there. You can find me on Twitter at Michael Waits. You know, direct message me, ask me anything. You can send me an email at michael.waits at gmail.com. Um, happy gonna, react- we have an Asia Tech Podcast Twitter handle as well now. We do. Asia Tech? Asia pod? Tech Pod. <laughs> exactly. Asia Tech Pod. Find us there. We're just starting out. So tweet us a hello. Please do. And read the blog as well. Asia Tech Podcast blog. We curate for you. I mean, I like to say, you know, what is it? Search less, read more, learn lots. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. We'll convene you, next yeah. week with more. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.